time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Hardy Burt, noted author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Averill Harriman, director of the Mutual Security Agency. Mr. Harriman, I'm sure that our viewers will be glad that you are making this second appearance on the Chronoscope. I'm very happy to be here. And tonight, sir, it seems that in these final days of the campaign, that the Korean issue seems to be uppermost. And I'd like to ask you first, sir, do you think that the tactic, as a political tactic, General Eisenhower's promise to personally go to Korea is an effective one? I can hardly believe that it is. Uh, the uh, way that came about, you remember, was that he uh, indicated that he had some uh, quick and easy way to end the war in Korea and then when he was pinned down, the only, only suggestion that he could make was that typical of a military man, that he would go to Korea. Well, now, I think all the American people know that the, that the heart of the trouble in Korea, uh, 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 in the fighting in Korea, isn't in Korea. It is in the United Nations and in the Kremlin. And, and uh, I, I believe people understand that and understand that it is a political tactic, uh, perhaps rather than desperation. Mr. Harriman, originally General Eisenhower had made the suggestions that Asians could fight Asians. In other words, the South Korean troops could be trained. Now, do you think there's any validity well, to it? Well, number one, uh, Eisenhower knows as well as uh, everyone who, who is with the government that we have been training South Koreans just as fast as they could be trained for over two years. There are over 400,000 South Koreans now well trained. They're taking responsibility for over half of the line in Korea, not only fighting bravely, which they've always done, but fighting very effectively, and they want to take on more and more as they're able to do so. Now, this idea of fight Asians fighting Asians shocked uh, the people in Asia because uh, it uh, broke from what we've been trying to do in the last seven years, build up the concept of collective security, which is working and which uh, is the basis on which we can look forward to uh, a successful uh, uh, ending of this struggle, not only well, Korea, but against co the worldwide communism. Well, now, sir, you've had extensive experience as a representative of this government abroad, and a good deal of that experience was, uh, was alongside General Eisenhower, wasn't it? Well, I've known General Eisenhower for the past uh, 12 years and worked very closely with him, and um, I do know him well. Well, now, during that 12-year period, uh, did you have a high regard for his ability as an international negotiator? I had a very high regard for him as a general, and I, and I still do, but I have never had, uh, he has never had an experience as an international negotiator. You will recall that he claims now to know how to deal with the Kremlin. Well, the facts of the matter are, and I knew it at the time because he came to see me in Moscow. He thought that he could get along with the Russians. Marshal Zhukov would succeed uh, Stalin. Uh, he, he wouldn't believe me when I said it wasn't so, and he came back and testified to the Congress uh, that, uh, these were his words, uh, uh, there is no one thing, I believe, which uh, guides the Russians so much as uh, having friendship with the United States. Well, now uh, he the was, uh, I don't blame him for his uh, hopes. Many honorable Americans had those hopes, but I do blame him for trying to pretend that he knew how to deal with the Russians then or now. He, is, uh, he has a military man's approach. He's shown that he does not understand our domestic affairs. That isn't any secret. Did you have he doesn't understand the international situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, outside of the military, and uh, that is one of the reasons well, why now the, uh, I, uh, I am opposed yes. to his, uh, not, uh, to, to well, his election as, uh, as president. The Coles, mag the Coles Publications, Look Magazine, uh, had a rather <coughs> impressive cartoon uh, last week in announcing their support of General Eisenhower, and they said that their entire support was based on the assumption that he would be a more effective international negotiator than Mr. Stevenson. Now, do you think that Mr. Stevenson would be just as effective as Eisenhower in well, dealing with foreign powers? I think far more so, because, uh, number one, it is not only the man, but it is the association. Now, first place about Stevenson, uh, he wanted to know about uh, communism. He, he went to Russia in 1926, and he learned, and he's been, uh, he's been alert to the dangers of communism ever, ever since. 
And in addition to that, he's had both experience during the war in the Navy Department. He represented us uh, in the United Nations, and he's had uh, a considerable experience as governor in administrative affairs. Now, it's a question of the people that a man gets around him, and it is a fact that three-quarters of the Republican Party in the Congress have voted against or to cripple the major measures, which are those which Eisenhower uh, professed that he was for. In other words, you, you don't believe that, uh, Mr. Harriman, that uh, Eisenhower is internationalist-minded, that he would... Uh, yes, he's, uh, uh, he's, he is internationalist-minded, but uh, he is, looks at things from a military standpoint, and he hasn't any more experience with uh, economic affairs or political affairs uh, internationally than he has here at home, and I assure you, well, there's no well, secret. In his, in his uh, post no. in Europe, didn't he have to deal with in economic and political terms? No, uh, he was the commanding general of the, uh, of the international army there, and that is another myth. Uh, he, uh, the uh, international negotiations were, were handled uh, uh, by, uh, by our political uh, leaders, and um, he dealt with the of bringing together of this international army, and he did that extremely well, but he had nothing to do with the economic or the political aspects. Well, so now this is a question of fact I'd like to, oh, in fact, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Harriman. Uh, immediately in 1945 and 46, uh, there perhaps was a great deal of misunderstanding in this country about the true nature of the communist conspiracy. Now, is it a matter of fact that you alerted this country to the nature of the communist conspiracy before General Eisenhower did? Well, it's a fact that, um, uh, as recorded in Inceptor Forrestal's diary, uh, in the notes of his diary, that, uh, that I explained uh, the, uh, the uh, dangers of communist aggression and subversion both in Europe and in the Far East. And uh, I, I, that was... Uh, um, that was... Uh, that's a, a matter of record. That was a year before, or nearly a year before, General Eisenhower testified that he thought uh, the Soviet policy was uh, friendship with the United States, so that uh, that is perfectly clear. Now, I don't know when General Eisenhower began to realize the dangers, but, uh, uh, because, but, but it was considerably after that time. May I ask a question about the current campaigning, Mr. Harriman? Uh, the uh, tactics of the president in this uh, give him hell Harry approach of type of campaigning have been rather widely criticized as not being in very good taste. Do you think that uh, they've been in good taste or bad taste? Well, all I can say is that I've been around uh, with the president and uh, some, sometimes I've been around to different states after he's been there. And the American people uh, uh, like to uh, have great respect for the, for the president and also uh, like the way he, uh, he, he lays things on the line. Now, it is a rather an odd thing that the so-called uh, one-party press and the Republicans have been yelling about uh, what he's been saying and not commenting on the daily smear that goes on by a man by the name of Richard Nixon who constantly says things which are not which are not true about uh, the great Democratic candidate and I think it's been uh, it is uh, they are yelling about it because it is hurting them. Do you I believe Nixon no, is I not do his believe, man? I do believe that uh, the, the very high-level campaign of, of, of Governor Stevenson the fact he's talking sense, the fact he's explaining things in his position is, uh, is inspiring people with greater and greater confidence. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I, I assume uh, that you... The swing, if I may say so, as I find it, around the country is growing with momentum and it's all one way. It's, it's, it's disappointment or dis disillusion with, with Eisenhower and the people that he's become associated with and greater and greater respect and confidence uh, in, uh, in Governor Stevenson. When did you... Uh uh, from your position of respect for Eisenhower, when did you <coughs> become disillusioned, sir? Well, I've, uh, I have uh, uh, admired General Eisenhower as a general. I've, I have never been in support of him as the President of the United States. I do not think he, is, he has had the experience uh, outside, of, and I d uh, outside of his military experience, and I do not think military experience qualifies a man for the Presidency of the United States. Uh, it is a very special type of work. He's always been protected in every form from the, on the economic side, and he is accustomed to be briefed by highly skilled people, um, whereas in a political life you've got to select very carefully your, your, your advisors and judge whether their advice is, is sound and, and good. And I do not think the military experience it is the right kind of experience for the grave responsibilities that the President of the United States do you, has. Do you believe that Governor Stevenson's experience is... Uh, 
has uh, made him, has trained him for the job? Well, I, I, I certainly do, because he's had uh, experience in government, the federal government, during the war in the, in the Navy Department, and representing, as I say, our, our country in international negotiations, and he's been one of the fine governors of one of our most important states, and he's shown his administrative ability, and he was a very experienced lawyer and a man. And then he's also showing a man of very deep confidence in our country and a very deep understanding of the aspirations of our people and, uh, the, uh, and the future of our country. I think his St. Louis speech where he outlined the, the uh, I, I think he said, the limitless uh, frontiers that existed uh, was, uh, was giving everybody a, a real... Uh, uh, from your, uh, from your experience abroad, sir, do you think that the nature of our political campaign here has damaged our relations abroad? Well, I, uh, if the election comes out in the manner in which I believe it will, with Governor Stevenson and a strong Democratic Congress, why then I'm, uh, then uh, there will be renewed confidence. What the, what the people of Europe and around the world fear is that we will turn away, as we did in the 20s, Lee Wilson's policy of sharing, the United States sharing the world responsibilities for, for peace and order. That, that uh, fear is very vivid still in people's memories. And uh, they are afraid of Taft, they are afraid of the isolationists that are, that are surrounding uh, Eisenhower, and they've been quite shocked by the uh, statements that uh, Eisenhower has, uh, has uh, made uh, during this campaign. You know, he's talked one way in one state and one way in another, and they're watching those things uh, constantly. But, but you feel that the election of uh, Governor Stevenson would repair whatever damage has been done? Oh, certainly. Do you certainly. think it would be <coughs> well, possible to cut um, taxes under a Stevenson I'm administration? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Burt. Our <laughs> time is up. Thank you very much for I being with us. I wish I could have answered that question. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you for being, being with you, and uh, hope to be with you again after the election when we can talk about the future. <laughs> the opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Averill Harriman, Director of the Mutual Security Agency. Next Tuesday, millions of Americans will go to the polls to exercise their right and privilege as citizens. Don't let your vote be lost, my friend, for freedom of choice is a very precious freedom. It extends throughout our life in this great republic, even to the things we buy, and is to help you exercise freedom of choice in the watch that you make your own, that we on this program give you the facts about Longines. It should mean something, and it does mean something, that in competition with the world's best watches, Longines is the only watch to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 Gold Medal Awards. It should mean something, and it does mean something, that in competition with the world's most accurate watches, Longines has won countless prizes in competitive accuracy trials at the great government observatories. So if you wish to choose for your own or to select as a gift just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, the facts about Longines should convince you. From personal experience, millions of discriminating men and women the world over have made this statement true that no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Make your election headquarters the CBS Television Network. A television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines.
Time for the Longine Chronoscope. Tactic. As a political tactic, General Eisenhower's promise to personally go to Korea is an effective one. I can hardly believe that it is. Uh, the uh, way that came about, you remember, was that he uh, indicated that he had some uh, quick and easy way to end the war in Korea, and then when he was pinned down... Mr. Harriman, I'm sure that our viewers will be glad that you are making this second appearance on the chronoscope. I'm very happy to be here. And tonight, sir, it seems that in these final days of the campaign that the Korean issue seems to be uppermost. And I'd like to ask you first, sir, do you think that the... Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Hardy Burt, noted author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Averill Harriman, director of the Mutual Security Agency.